Good evening, everybody. Welcome to my book launch. <laughs> I thought I was meant to do the welcome. I wasn't am, I, sure. am I not meant to be hosting this? Sorry, Dermot, I, I, did I fail you already? We're only <laughs> 10 seconds in. Um, Niall Brezzy Breslin, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Well done. Thank you. What a week. Uh, it's been an incredible week. Um, I never thought in my wildest dreams I would have a number one bestseller. Um, the new book is mindful, and I want to say thank you so much to everybody who bought the book um, and came on to see the launch here. I, if you are reading it or have read it, I really hope you enjoyed it because um, it's just uh, it's just a, a really really special time for me, and I'm so delighted that the book is out there and people can read it. I was terrifying. Isn't it? It's terrifying putting a book out. Like no matter what way you put it, writing it is kind of quite cathartic and quite enjoyable to a point. But then that moment of sending it to your publisher, you know, then getting the first print, and then that breath you have to take when you know it's gone out into the world and people are reading it. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit. And what we'll try, I suppose, to do here is to kind of provide context around the book and why you wrote it and why it was so important to you write it personally, because I think that's what people want to know. Uh, but first and foremost is to take that is the moment that like a number one uh, book is tough to get. It's a tough thing to do. And when you first heard that, was it just, you know, because I saw your Instagram thing, I was going to ring you and I was like, no, nah, I'll, I'll leave him kind of longer. I don't <laughs> want to, he's probably got millions of people ringing him now. Well, I didn't actually, no, I don't, I'm so new. You've written lots of books. I'm so new to all of this that I had no idea what, like, what the, chain of events is when you release a book. I didn't know anything. So I just got a call um, from the wonderful Neve from my agency. Hello, Neve. <laughs> and uh, she said, hello, um, am I speaking to uh, the author of the number one bestseller? No, no I was like, what? What? Uh, she so, should have went, actually, wrong number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, no, Dermot Gavin. I was looking for Dermot Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> He's a um, search for number one. But yeah, like, because it lives so long in your head, and so long on your laptop, it, it doesn't seem real for a lot mm. of the time. So once it goes out into the world, <clears throat> you can have kind of wobbly moments going, oh my God, why did I put so much personal stuff in there? Because <laughs> like, mm. yeah. it's quite personal. Like, you know, you know, particularly the book is a mixture of my own story because I felt it was really important to put context to, the, to how a Limerick stand-up comedian ended up you know, doing this kind of it's thing. It's inevitable, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I felt that's why I wanted to put it in the book. And there's some mm. personal things in there. Like, I was, you know, a bit all over the shop, mm. you know. And, I, and to actually, sometimes when you take some isolated incidents that happened over a course of some years, when you put them all together on a, on a f few chapters, it makes you look kind of worse than you yeah. are. But you I know? don't know if it does. Like, I remember when I wrote, wrote my, my book, and, and I, I, do you know the hardest thing for me was giving it to my mum? And my mum knew the story, but it's, t it's tough for a mother to read that, you know, or a father. And I remember giving her the book uh, and the print, drove down to Mullingar, went, bye, left the house, and I literally drove around Ireland. I drove to Galway and down to Ennis and across because I knew she was going <clears> to <throat> read it straight away. And I was terrified what she was going to think. <clears throat> and I got to Arklow, and I just got this text going, I've never been prouder of you. And it's just that moment of, like, that's all that mattered to me at that point, because it was very, very personal. And I suppose a good way to talk about that is to ask why you wrote the book. But I mean, you know, when I first got into meditation many, many years ago, I, I told you this story. At the time, I was in all over the place as well, and I, I keep people kept saying, "You should do meditation." You should. I was like, "I can't," because every time I try to focus on my breath, I have a panic attack. It's it's not what I want to do with my life, and I then finally went, "Fuck it, I'll give this a shot." And I I got an app, and people kept telling me, and I went up. I was at home at the time, and my dad was downstairs cooking, and I went up to the the room, and I didn't want anyone to know what I was doing. I had told no one I was going to start trying meditation because if 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 they found out, I'd be absolutely mortified. And I went up to my room and I put on my headphones and I turned all the lights, put on a smelly candle. I was like, this is, this is nice. This is actually not so bad. I like this, you know, and the man's nice voice. And my dad was downstairs cooking and, and then I could hear these footsteps coming up the stairs. I'm like, oh God, don't come in here now. I'm, I'm actually relaxed for the first time in 20 years. <laughs> and 
and my dad knocks on the door and comes in to tell me dinner's ready and I scream at him, I am meditating! <laughs> and I'm pretty sure he thought I said something else. <laughs> and my dad was in the army, so he's pretty deaf because he's been shooting artillery for most of his life. And this was the point. I went down for dinner and I, I had this kind of cognitive conversation with myself in the chair on the stairs down going, am I better off letting him think what he thinks already <laughs> or telling him that I'm meditating? It would be easier for him just to think that I was 13 again. <laughs> and, you know, after Baywatch, I'm just going to bed early. <laughs> just, yeah. And we sat at the table and to this day, I think this is probably the first time my dad's going to realise that I didn't say what I, he thought I said because it was too embarrassing to tell him. Can you tell me about your journey into meditation and mindfulness and why you felt at that point in your life that this was something I had to look at? Yeah, well, 2007 is a kind of a, a crystallizing, a perfect storm of stress for me because I had a lot going on. I was doing breakfast radio, so I was up at five o'clock in the morning. I was... Um, well, actually, 4.30, really, but I suppose maybe I actually got out of bed at 5 o'clock. <laughs> um, but I was doing comedy at night time, so I was in the clubs after, after midnight. Um, I had a baby at home. I was doing bits of telly. My comedy stand-up career was taken off. Um, I was starting to do corporate stuff as well. So I had all these jobs going, and I had no stress management tools, and I had no awareness of when my body was trying to send, send me signals that it was running on nothing but adrenaline and pints, <laughs> you know, and this wasn't sustainable. And I was driving to Kenny Catlaff's Comedy Festival to perform, and I had a panic attack. I didn't know what it was. I'd never had one before. Thankfully, I haven't had one since. But I thought I was having a heart attack. I couldn't breathe, and it felt like the invisible man came into the car and sat on top of me. Mm. And I just, I, I literally felt like every bit of wind was being pushed out of me. Mm. So I remember I got, got to the side of the road, thought I was dying. Uh, somebody called an ambulance. I got into the ambulance and uh, they gave me a piece of, of incredible life-saving equipment. And it was a brown paper bag because yeah. <laughs> I was hyperventilating. Yeah. And they went, you're not dying. You're having an anxiety attack. And they gave me a brown paper bag, which still smelt of the sandwiches <laughs> Yeah, of the, whatever were in it five minutes before I started nearly dying. I was like, wow, just the health service, what's happening? This is the best you can give me? Uh, but they were brilliant. Probably was, to be fair. Yeah, it was. That's what I needed at the yeah. time, you know. But I suppose, <clears throat> you know, when you find that out and you go to the hospital and they check your heart and all that, it was, you felt, I felt really stupid, you know, mm -hmm. because I felt like I'd wasted everybody's time that I thought it was worse than it actually wa it was. Um, but then when I left, the hospital, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know mm. what to do with that information. They mm. just said, are, are, are you stressed? And I said, mm, yeah, maybe. And they went, what do you do for a living? I'm a stand-up comedian. They went, oh, right. <laughs> okay, yeah. best of luck with that. Um, so, you know, that was kind of the point for me that, okay, well, whatever I'm doing, my body's just sent me a massive message there, mm -hmm. you know, because I think our body sends us little whispers. And then if we don't ignore that, it shouts a little bit louder. And then if we're not listening at all, it screams. And, and that's what it is, mm -hmm. uh, what it was for me. So I decided that, you know what, I probably need something that's going to help me out here. And, and meditation came my way quite by chance after that. And you're right. Your brain is an alarm system, and it's an incredible alarm system. It's a security guard. It's there to keep you alive. It's there to protect you. And stress is there to protect you. And it's a crucial part of the human experience. And it's our, it's our framing of stress that often is the problem. You know, you probably got to that stage because you repressed that and you pushed it down and you didn't express it. And that's, what's, that's what happens. And I think that alarm system goes off a lot quicker when you can't express, you know what, guys, I'm actually a bit rinsed here. I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted. And you look something like the pandemic right now. A lot of people, I'm saying the way we're all feeling now are perfectly normal human responses to an incredibly abnormal situation. And it's, it's okay we feel like this. Mm. this. Isn't it wonderful that we have an, a body and an alarm system that does this? And something I, I wanted to ask you around that, like, you know, from that, I often, often feel that when we get to that level of overwhelm and that anxiety attack and that panic attack, sometimes what I used to do was to try and use my mind to calm my mind down, which is the most pointless thing you could do. Like, you, you calm down now, come on now, you shouldn't be. It's pointless. And where I found meditation and mindfulness really powerful was the ability to use your body to calm your mind. Yeah. And how they are intrinsically linked 
and connected and they're speaking to each other every day. And what I have felt in the modern world in the last couple of years is that we now have Google that tells us everything. We have watches to tell us how fit we are. We have phones to tell us how much sleep we're getting. We're utterly disconnecting from our mind-body connection. And we're wondering why we're getting these overwhelms because there is no warning shots for people. Because their body, when I get anxious or overwhelmed like you did, it's my throat. I can feel it in my throat, it closes up. And I know something's up. And my body's not saying, Niall, there's something wrong. Just going, Niall, there will be something wrong if you don't start taking care of yourself. Did you find from that moment in, in Muller Navat, I believe, is, is where that happened? Yeah. What a place, what a place to have your, <laughs> yeah. your moment of reckoning. The first chapter is Don't Let Me Die in Muller Navat, <laughs> uh, which was a very real thought for Sounds me. Sounds like a country time. song, doesn't it, really? <laughs> yeah, a, really it does, yeah. a country song I'd love to listen to as well. That's the most yeah. interesting part. But from that point of where you've realised that, right, God, this is... This is, this is not normal. And I, all that was was utter fatigue, exhaustion, stress. It, it's not sustainable behavior to do what you were doing. And, and you know that now. Has there been other, other, mom, other moments from that point where you were like, well, yeah, no, uh, maybe this has been around all along. And this was just something that has been the kind of moment where I, right, this, is, this isn't something I, wanna, I want to deal with all my life. Was there other things that happened and, and from that point have happened along the way? Yeah, and I suppose when I really started to, you know, meditation is great because it gives you space and it gives you space in your mind um, and in your general self to start to look at your own behavior patterns mm -hmm. and you start to realize, well, actually, was it an isolated incident really down in, you know, in Mullinavat or were there other things that happened to me before that? And you start to go in and look for little clues and I realized, well, you know what? I actually was a really, really shy kid. Like I was known for going red. I have a story in the book about this incident when I was in secondary school and I went so red that people were, were saying, look, there's your man who went purple. <laughs> I, I went beyond red into purple. I was so embarrassed. So I used to blush so easily. I couldn't talk to grown-ups, couldn't talk to girls. Um, and that's probably why you end up leaning into things like alcohol when you're a teenager, mm -hmm. because you can try and navigate that whole scary place, you know? You talked about your throat. I remember when I started working in radio, I was reading the news one day and my throat just closed up while I was reading. And it went, oh, and I turned into this weird Kermit the Frog Yoda newsreader, mm. which was very entertaining, but it's not what you want to listen to when you need the headlines. Um, Depends what headline is. Yeah, yeah. If it was about Kermit the Frog, it would have been perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the news at six. Mm. Uh, but like... You know, there are little clues and I realized that actually there was a pattern here. This was just a big, perfect storm, but there was a pattern. And the more time I spent in meditation, the more I made friends with those parts of me that are still a little bit shy to this day. You know, they're in there and, and they're, as you say, they're just our inner alarm. They're just trying to protect us. What I'd love to do is actually get a little stress test of all our, our uh, viewers at the moment and just do a little poll um, and see where you're at right now watching us mm. um, because uh, later on we're going to do a meditation mm -hmm. and hopefully we're going to do all the things that meditation does that science tells us we're going to lower heart rates we're going to lower blood pressure we're going to lower those stress hormones um, and then we'll do a little stress test at the end uh, mm. just to see because I think it's important that you kind of we check in with ourselves and see where we are you know and sometimes we need to do that in the day and you, when you do take a couple of breaths you can go you connect in with your body and you can say, OK, I'm a little bit frazzled today. Mm -hmm. OK, what do I need to do to just bring everything down? So um, if you can go to the go to the poll and you can click the, on the poll there and there's four options as to how stressed you are, <laughs> um, which I can't see here without my glasses. Can I guess what they are? <laughs> <laughs> I just want like the stress is they're screaming at birds randomly in the back garden level of stress. I did that a few times this pandemic. You screamed at the birds just in the garden? Out. And they're lovely birds. Like I just, I just felt that that was, I needed to go. I live with my parents for 12 months and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just releasing something <laughs> or jumping into cold water. I just, like, I, I hit those moments of acute overwhelm a few times, I have to say. Because it there hasn't felt like there's been a release. And I think talking about mindfulness and meditation to people listening in, you know, it's important to point out that this is a skill that can be developed. And like every skill, it does take practice. And you're talking to like, you know, yourself and to myself, like my, I, when I did my first silent retreat, my family were taking bets for how long I'd last because they were like, this guy's not going to be doing this. He can't sit still for 10 seconds. Mm. And I knew I was up against it. I knew that 
and you talk about it giving you space. For me, what it did is it provided a clearing. It created a clearing, and it's, it's this beautiful poem. It creates a clearing in the dense forest of your brain where you realize you can come out and you can observe yourself in a different way. And mindfulness is often referred to as insight. Mm. And people go, well, what does that mean? And insight for me, so what I found with meditation and generally the conversation around meditation in the kind of wellness culture is that it's simply a tool for relaxation. But for me, mindfulness is far, far deeper than that. It's a tool for awareness where you start to get, gain insight into how you were a shy kid and how that still affects you now in relationships and other things. And I think that's where I got my most learning from mindfulness is the idea that I am cracked. I have issues. Uh, but every human being on earth has issues. We're imperfect beings living in an imperfect world that punishes imperfection. And what mindfulness does for me is, is make me okay with that. Yeah, well let's look at our, our poll. So 14% are feeling totally chill. Jesus. 57% um, are a little edgy. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Maybe it's that hard. That fault. could be quite subjective. 19% uh, pretty wired and 7% uh, are help, I'm stressed out of my mind. Okay. So that's interesting because, you know, over half are a little edgy. And I think that's where a lot of us are spending our time, particularly at the moment, and where we have spent our time over the last year. You know, people... Are, know that they're just a little bit frazzled, and how does that how does that translate in your in your day when your stress response is kicking in and you haven't you don't have any of the mm. techniques just to put it to sleep for a little while? So that could be us being uh, snappy, impatient at home. You know, uh, we could be firing off emotional emails without actually sitting down and going, okay, do I really want to send this one? Mm. Um, we could be being hard on ourselves, so our inner critic could be, the volume on that could be turned mm -hmm. up a little bit. And that's how it kind of manifests, and certainly for me, if I, if, if I, I will know I'm stressed if I start to hear myself being hard on myself, mm, if you big get time, me. yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and a lot of the time, you know, a lot of us aren't completely stressed out and we're, you know, freaking out. Yeah. But a lot of us will move up and down that anxiety scale, mm -hmm. you know, from very chill to stress out of the mind. And I think since all the craziness in the world started, we tend to move up a little bit further up yeah, that yeah. scale. And that's why, I, you know, I, I'm dying for this book to get out there is because it's got those techniques in there yeah. that can help us just bring ourselves back down. Now, we're human. We're going to keep going up and down on that. But the more of these techniques that we do, the more we can stay... Uh, a little bit calmer, feel like a little bit more like ourselves. And that's not to say we're not going to freak out or we're not going to get angry or, you know, we're not going to, um, you know, get annoyed or sad or whatever. But for me, I found that when I started these techniques, I didn't stay in that state as long. Mm. So something might, and it wasn't as acute. So something mm. might still annoy me, but I don't suddenly go to DEFCON 5, mm. you know, and it doesn't stay with me for the whole day. And that was something, you know, that I do talk about in the book is that when I was in radio in the early days, if something went wrong on the show, something mm. small, that annoyance would stay with me for yeah. the whole day. And totally. I would take it, it would home. would hijack you. Yeah. And like how many parents are watching right now who manage to keep it together in work <laughs> and we keep it together for all the things we need to do. And sometimes it's at home, it's, it's actually with the people we care about the most where those cracks start to show. Yeah. And we might be a little impatient around the kids' bedtime and we just want them to go to sleep so we can sit down and have a glass of wine or turn on Netflix or whatever it is. And we end up wishing away the most important part of our day and that's the time yeah. with the people that we care about the most. So, you know, if 57% of us are feeling a little bit edgy, you know, imagine how great it would be if you could dissolve that edginess, like you're dropping a disburn into a glass of water. Imagine how great it would be if you could just dissolve that enough so that when you're with the people you really care about, that you're your you're best self yeah. and you're actually present and there and you can hear what they want to but say that's to you. that's mindfulness. Mindfulness yeah. is presence. And if you bring that back, right, that what we often refer to is hyper-aroused mode. That's, that's the edginess, it's just hyper-aroused. When we lived in caves, so from an evolutionary psychology, but when we lived in caves, our ancestors lived in caves, and Dublin rental prices didn't require you to sell vital organs. Um, when we left the cave, every time we left the cave, we believed there was a spine-crushing, lung-busting python behind the bush, even though 99 times out of 100 there wasn't. But that one time there was, we were gone, and we, and we were safe, and we survived. Now, we, that, that, that was that hyper-aroused, anxious state. 
and that kept us alive. It was an amazing survival tool. But the minute you got back into the cave, you, you were calm again, back to homeostasis. That element of like, I'm safe here, grand. The problem in the modern world is you get, you know, that spine crushing, lung busting python is now sitting on your chest when you're watching Netflix, when you're on your phone, because our brains don't know the difference between real and perceived threat. So we think threat's everywhere now. And it, you know, we pick up our phone. So that edginess is often because we are causing those triggers ourselves. We are exposing ourselves to stuff that does that. No matter how much meditation you do, if you're constantly on Twitter all the time, you're going to be hyper aroused, and, 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 and that's not a good thing, by the way. Hyper aroused is, is that fight or flight, constant 50% edginess. And meditation is really important, but what's also important is understanding what are your triggers? What are you consuming? What are you watching? And often when we get stressed and overwhelmed, we do the opposite of what we should do to our body. We, we feel that we can eat 45 kilograms of Maltesers. And, you know, and I, 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 when, you, when you feel like that and edgy, be so kind to yourself. You know, mm. treat yourself well. Drink a lot of water. Rest. And rest doesn't mean sleep. Yeah. Rest means sitting and on your arse doing nothing and not feeling guilty about it. Exposure to news as well. You know, I talk about, there's a study in the book, um, a Harvard study done with Arianna Huffington, and, and an author, and what they did was they exposed people to three minutes of negative news every single morning. Um, and then they asked them how they felt at the end of the day, or how they felt the day had gone. Mm. And people were far more likely, 27% more likely to say, my day was crap, mm -hmm. if they had exposed themselves to just three minutes of negative news. And, and that doesn't mean that you have to walk around with your head in the sand and, and never listen to the radio or, or because that would put me out of a job anyway. Yeah. Um, but there was also an aspect of it where some people in another group were shown different kinds of news. They were shown stories that had a positive outcome, like, you know, um, inner city kids overcoming the odds and, and becoming a great success or, you know, a, a, a pensioner passing his driving test at 72. You know, and people who watched positive news stories, it had the opposite effect. When they were asked at the end of the day, how do you think your day went? They said it was, you were far more likely to say it went well because you'd taken that bit of positivity, you'd actually dropped that little nugget into your subconscious first thing in the morning. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, being more aware of the kind of stuff that we're exposing ourselves to every day does, does have an impact and, as and well. If you look at modern media, and this is a really important conversation around, we've never in the history of humankind been exposed to so much information. And back to the, our ancestors who lived in caves, they had a negativity bias, which meant they, they put more emphasis on negative things than positive things. That's what kept them alive. They always believed something bad was going to happen, and it kept them really cautious, and they survived the madness of whatever that world was. We still have that negativity bias. That's why every EastEnders episode is chronically depressing. That's why Netflix shows are all about drug dealers and murders. That's why the algorithms on social media drive us towards anger and frustration, because it's good for business. And this is the thing, it's good for business and engagement and it gets our attention, but it's not good for us. And we're getting rinsed by it because we're unaware that we're being pulled into these, you know, t you know, Twitter threads where you spend 20 minutes going, oh my God, what did I just do for the last 20 minutes? It's not your fault, it's, it, you're pulled there. And what mindfulness did to me was gave me insight that I had this bias and going, ah, hire listen, I don't want to spend the next three hours of my day feeling overwhelmed and you know, dejected with humanity by reading that thread, so I pull myself back. And that's real awareness, and that's what mindfulness taught me. And just saying to people that these types of triggers aren't our fault. Our brains are designed to pull us down those holes. They love them. And many people within the technolo technology world know this. And I often call, like, the social media, the people who own these social media platforms, I love social media, but it, it is a cesspit, like, let's be honest. <laughs> uh, but the people who own these are, like, Roman lords sitting in the Colosseum, up watching us rip each other limb from limb like gladiators and for their, for their entertainment, i.e. their bank balance. And I kind of look at people and go, this isn't representative of us. We're far better than this. We don't have to tear each other limb from limb because we have different opinions. We don't have to, you know, I don't think it represents humanity very well. And I've always, and I know you do too, and I think it's important that we, we, we highlight this. I have an inordinate level of faith in people. I do, I think when you strip people back, and you give them this type of kind of techniques to, to become more comfortable in their own skin. They won't feel the need to go out there ripping pe other people limb from limb. And that's what I feel meditation taught me. Do you, f do you find that, you know, with those types of tools, with the work that you're doing, that it's given you that type of insight to the other types of triggers that you might have had in your life? And I don't know what they might be, but we all have triggers. Yeah. 
Well, th the big issue for me is I've just come to know my brain better. I've know, I know the signs that when I need to turn off my stress response, you know, and you know, sometimes when I'm trying to describe that, I, you know, I'll show a picture of Homer Simpson choking Bart, yeah. you know, and then I'll show a picture of Katie Taylor. And, you know, what do these two people have in common? Well, Bart, oh, at that moment, both of their stress responses are active, but they're act reacting in incredibly different ways. So Homer does a lot of the time what we all do, and that's overreact, react emotionally, and lash out at the people around us, particularly the people that we love. Whereas Katie Taylor, even though someone is literally trying to punch her face in, she is making better decisions in the moment, thinking and moving quicker, and handling the stress response so much better. Now, we may never, as mere mortals, reach Katie Taylor levels of managing stress, but we can certainly do better than Homer Simpson. Mm. And that's why these techniques, of, uh, why I really wanted to simplify everything in the book for people and get rid of all the fluff and, and stuff and dogma that comes with a lot of meditation and wellness in general, and just boil it down to, like, our stress response is an incredible machine and it does amazing things and it helps us to perform at our absolute best and helps us to think faster and make better decisions in the moment. But that alarm inside our heads, just like a smoke alarm in your house, can't keep ringing all the time mm -hmm. or it will wear you out. So these techniques are there in the book to help you do that. I know there's another poll we have, sorry, is, um, is how often do you meditate? Because I think for a lot of people watching, they may Sorry, have... I just still heard that first, my father's, that flashback of my father's <laughs> conversation came back there, like, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> it was like, meditate, Rezzy, meditate. Like, they kind of, <laughs> shut up, there. Just after pay watch. <laughs> um, but, I, uh, because I think for a lot of people, you know, my teacher, David G, the chap I trained with in the States. Yeah, I interviewed David G, yeah. Yeah, Amazing wonderful man. man. And he, he talks about crisis meditators, you know. And I think a lot of people on this this evening, and a lot of you watching at home, would be, possibly fall into that category. Mm. So you, you're a mildly aware of meditation. You might have tried it once or twice. Maybe it worked for you for a while. But it just sort of fades away and it drops out of our daily routine. And then something happens in your life. And you're, you know, it could be, oh my God, I got to give a presentation, or someone I know is sick, or, um, you know, I've, 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 I've got to go for a job interview, I got to do a driving test, whatever it is comes up in your life, and suddenly you're like, hmm, <laughs> trying, to, trying, to, trying to cram that you know, two years worth of meditation into 10 minutes before you go in and, and like you know, the, give like a the PowerPoint. Like the leaving cert. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, I, I just want to get a feel for where people are tonight on, yeah, yeah. in terms of their meditation. Like maybe my book is the first time you've ever tried it. Maybe it's something you were interested in in the past, but maybe the book is a way of getting back into it. Um, so you, you should be able to see a poll popping up there on the screen. Um, just asking you, how often do you meditate? So it could be like never, maybe it's sometimes, mm. maybe you're at it every single day and you're a, you're a total pro, but I'd love to get, okay, mm. so... Have you got the four questions? Do you know? I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah so we have um, never, but I'd like to start every day. Uh, some days when I remember, I tried it, but it's just not for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're, and they're, they're pretty common answers. And I think it's important to point out around the difference between, not the difference, but the slight difference between meditation and mindfulness. And meditation is a practice that you do to become more mindful. And mindfulness is, is, is a way of life. And for me, the most transformative thing that's happened in my life at mindfulness is the informal stuff, not just the meditation, the, the ability to be present with loved ones, the ability to, when I'm communicating, see other people's points of view, the ability not to react, as you said, from a place of, of habitual reaction. And I think mindfulness is, when we look at meditation, meditation is one of the things that help you become that way. And sometimes they get mixed up a little bit and I think, although they're the same thing, there's ways of practicing meditation and mindfulness without just concentrating on your breath. Some people really struggle with that. You know, as you like, we both love music. Sometimes a really great way to meditate is just to put on your favorite album and pretend you're sitting in that room with the, the artist and you're breathing with it. Sometimes it's playing a perfect round of golf in your head mm. because people find, and actually if you look at the Buddhist, some of the Buddhist principles of mindfulness, the present moment wasn't. Uh, the, the, the be all and end all of meditation was actually anchoring your attention in something that doesn't overwhelm you. And that could be a lovely song or a, a, yeah. a visualized round of golf. So if you're struggling with the breath, here's your brother. I'm not going to visualize a round of golf. As well, I, I actually uh, have last my time stress I played response. golf, I hit the bishop of Mead, Mead Westmead in the shin with a golf ball. <laughs> <and> <laughs> definitely cursed. 
<laughs> he definitely could. And are the Mead, Mead, Bishop of Weed Westmead, uh, he, he's, he's like, he's one of the loveliest men ever. But I definitely believe it was an act of whatever is up there because he was standing at a right angle to where I was aiming. There was no way I could hit the ball that way. So, <laughs> so something brought the ball there. And it wasn't my shot. Maybe he deserved it. Maybe he didn't deserve knows? it. But I just, uh, let's he have did. a look at the, the results of the poll. Uh, in, you've been ask, I've just been asking you how, uh, how often do you meditate just so we get a, a feeling of, of where everybody's at because mm -hmm. I think we're all at different places on that yeah, sometimes. And, and people thinking that they're doing it wrong. You know, one of the biggest myths that I want to bust with this book is that we don't have to clear our mind of all thoughts. You and can't. That's, you literally can't. And you don't want to because if you don't have thoughts, you're, you're dead. Yeah. Like, the minute your thoughts stop, you're gonzo. Yeah. Um, we have 80,000 of them every single day. So it, we don't have to chase every single thought that we have down the road. We don't have to swipe right on absolutely every yeah. unhelpful thought that enters our skulls. Um, and so once people relax into that idea of, oh, so I don't have to clear my mind. So it's okay if my mind is busy. Yes, that's it. Is. Because meditation is very simply focusing your mind on one thing. When your mind wanders off, which it absolutely will, you just realize it's wandered and you gently bring it back. Yeah. And it's a tennis match between attention, distraction, attention and distraction. And that ball will bounce and it will bounce. It can bounce. 500 times in a five minute meditation. Mm. And each time all you're doing is going, oh, I'm thinking about the dog. Oh, I'm thinking about an email. I'm thinking about work tomorrow. I'm thinking about what are we gonna make for dinner. And you're just letting that ball come, keep bouncing back to whatever you're focusing on, whether that's music, yeah. whether that's your breath, whether that's um, you know a mantra, like a word or a phrase you're repeating in your mind. So the poll is how often you meditate, 22%. So a fifth of you say never, but I'm dying to start, excellent. Um, every day is 16%, so you guys are already up on the horse's back. Such like horses. Uh, some days when I remember to do it is 41%. So that's okay. where the majority the of people core. are. And that's possibly that crisis meditator group yeah. that we were talking about. And then I, a, a fifth of people say, mm. I tried it, um, but I, I can't seem to do it. Or I, I think I'm doing it wrong. Okay. Uh, and that's who, you know, that's who I really want to reassure with this book is that You've heard a lot of stuff about having to clear your mind and you're worried that you have more thoughts than everybody else and maybe meditation is for something, uh, is for other people, but not for you. Like, what do you tell people if they say, anytime I focus on my breath, it starts to make me more anxious? Don't focus on your breath. Simple as that, focus on your body, focus on something else. It's just anchor your attention. I, I work with people quite a lot in therapeutic settings with mindfulness and I'm working with one per person at the moment and they keep crying when they meditate. And I went, and they went, she goes, is that okay? I said, well, how does it feel? She goes, it feels amazing. I went, perfect. You, it's almost, I said, this idea, and, and the best way to say this to people who are getting into meditation, what really helps you have a north star to this practice is what I call the principles of practice. The things that you can hold on to when you feel a bit lost with your practice. The first thing about meditation is non-judgment. When your mind wanders, like you said it will do, don't go, ah, oh, for feck's sake, Mary, I'm, I knew I'd be terrible at this. Oh, I'm terrible. My mind is, don't do that yourself. You have enough of that in your life. This is a space of non-judgment. You don't need to judge yourself on that. That's just your mind doing its job. Second is non-striving. Don't try to achieve anything when you sit down. You're not going to go, I need to get to some higher state of consciousness. You don't. You just need to sit with the good, the bad, and the ugly, whatever that is. Mm. And then beginner's mind or curiosity. Be really curious to what you're experiencing, where you're feeling it. If you are anxious, do I, where do, do I feel it here? Or, and really explore it like a kid would, like a baby would explore a new world. The fourth is I call it chucking in the feckit bucket. Everyone needs a feckit bucket in their life. You need to throw stuff in there that you've no control over, that overwhelms you. So when you meditate, you said your main, mind's racing, this is usually what happens. Oh, I forgot to ring Mary today and work. God, Mary's going to be raging. Oh God, she already thinks I hate her. Oh God, but I get a pizza later. I'm starving. Oh, so many calories in the pizza. I need to go to the gym. I'm putting on. Now you're down a rabbit hole and you're anxious. Mm. You've created the emotional charge and you went there. And the key is just chuck that in the bucket and come back to it. Come back to whatever anchor yeah. you're using. I mean, three, three things can happen essentially when you meditate. Yeah. You could fall asleep and that means that you're tired yeah. and you might have needed a rest. Yeah. And plus, a lot of the time, because we've trained our bodies that you know, when our eyes are closed and uh, where our breath is suddenly slower and deeper mm. and we're comfortable and we're warm, your body goes, ah, I know what this is. This is sleep. Knock them out. <laughs> you know, 
When we learn to meditate, we create a new state where, yeah, you're breathing slower and you're breathing deeper. Um, yes, your eyes might be closed. Yeah, you could be really comfy and warm, but actually your mind is alert mm. and it gets to no know way. that. So if you fall asleep when you start to meditate, don't worry about it. Enjoy the snooze mm. because over time, your body will learn that there's another state that you can mm. be in. And if you're worried about falling asleep, just try meditating, sitting up, just don't lie or down. Or open your eyes. You're, yeah, you are open your eyes, yeah. You're yeah. less likely to fall asleep. The second thing that might happen other than falling asleep is that you will have thoughts. Yeah. And as we said, 80,000 thoughts a day, they're not going anywhere. It's just a tennis match. When the ball bounces off the distraction, you bring it back to attention. And the third thing mm. is you will find, the third thing that can happen when you meditate is that you'll find that moment of stillness and silence. Mm. And that may only be a few seconds if that's all you can allocate at the start, if that's where you are at the start, and that's fine. Yeah. But never underestimate the power of a few moments of stillness and silence in your day. Um, we, we're going to let people get your questions in, by the way, if, yeah. if you do want to uh, ask us a question, just use the chat box. A lot of you have been already. We're going to get to them in a few minutes. Um, we're going to do a meditation. So I'm going to do a little bit longer meditation, just mm -hmm. give people a feel of... Um, you know, some of the techniques that I have in the book. And also just to, because we're all together, we're all on this, we've taken the time out, so, so why not do it? I love your, your techniques as well, because you, you have ones for on the go. And mm -hmm. I think that's really important that we have little meditations for in the moment <clears throat> when something happens. Yeah. We're not necessarily mm -hmm. on our comfy cushion with the dog on our lap thinking, this is my moment to mm -hmm. meditate. You're actually out and about, something triggers you, and you just need something to calm yourself down. Yeah, and I had panic disorder for 15 years. Um, like, you know, I, and you went through that really chronic panic attack, and they're terrifying. Um, I was having a few a day at the height of it, it, it was just uncontrollable for me and, and it, they weren't subtle either and I'm not subtle, I'm six foot six. You know, and what I started to le need to learn very quickly was how I can get myself out of that acute phase of overwhelm, which many of us experience, you know, like in Lidl when you're trying to pay for the food, you can't find your wallet and there's 30 lads tutting behind you and, go, and you start and The food panicking. is still tumbling <laughs> down. Like, Come back to me and you, you freak out and, and it's I like, have no and, bags. And that could just be an after crap day in work and it just could be that thing that just, I can't, or the kids are just fucking wrecking your head and you get that overwhelm, it's like a wave. And what, we, what, what I teach is how to get people out of that. And it's called the physiological side, and it was taught to me by a man called Dr. Andrew, Andrew Huberman, who's the head of neuroscience at the medical school in Stanford in America. And he has studied the brain. What, he, what isn't known about the brain isn't, he knows everything. He's an incredible, incredible researcher. And this physiological side, what it does, it, it engages a set of neurons in the brain that automatically and very quickly tend to tell the central nervous system that you're okay. Okay, so talk, talk us through the technique. So it's a very simple one. And all you have to do is two sharp inhales through the nose and a really, really long exhale through the mouth. And it's three times. And the key here is the exhale, not the inhale. Everyone thinks it's, it's how it's breathing. It's actually, the exhale is the thing saying to your central nervous system, Brezzi, you're all right, relax, pay for your food, they can feckin' wait. This is why you see lads like Johnny Sexton or Ronan Agara or just exactly. before they take a kick, you know, a, a, on a rugby field, it's... It's grounding. And you yeah. can see the cam coming. Like, and so why should these techniques be either for monks in the Himalayas, yogis in caves, or elite athletes? Like, we all deserve a bit we of this. We need it more than they this do. This is why I wanted to put we, it in the book. <laughs> yeah, we need it more yeah. than they do. But if you just practice it, it's so simple. So you breathe in. So... Put, Oh, keep going longer. <laughs> Chill. <laughs> Three times. Measure your heart rate if you have a heart rate monitor. Check it in 20 seconds. And this is the reality of that's, that's a central nervous system. That is using your body to calm your mind. Mm -hmm. And that is what I want people to really practice with mindfulness. Don't use their mind. Your mind doesn't want to calm the mind. Your mind is irrational. It's just going to make you more anxious. Get your body to go right. And that's why we use grounding. Where are your feet? Where are your feet? My feet are on the floor. Where are my hands? It's because your body is saying, calm down, bud. Relax. And this is the reality. Your body and your mind are best allies, best friends. Get to know them. Make them stronger. Buddy, stop listening to every Google to tell you everything about your own body. 
you don't need a, a, an app to tell you how, how much quality sleep you're getting. You'll know it. Yeah. Reconnect with your own experience and trust your body that's been with you from day one and knows more about you than anybody else and listen to it. And yeah. that's what mindfulness and meditation does. Well, we're going to connect into that now because I want to take you through a meditation and I want to use some of the techniques that I have in the book. So we're going to build up in this. So wherever you are, and remember, I am a big fan of real meditation. Anyone who watches my Instagram live ones that I do on Sundays knows that things happen. Last weekend, last weekend I was doing the meditation and my dog started barking and uh, the doorbell rang and people were talking. And look, these, this, because that's real life. And sometimes you'll sit down to meditate and all the kids come in on top of you and they're all asking you questions. Are the phone rings, are the doorbell rings, are just the deep, the, I think Amazon delivery people know exactly when you're sitting down to meditate because they will come when you, when you do it, they'll come to the front door. So, so I might bark in the middle of this just to yeah, recreate yeah. it for you. So look, if anything happens in your environment that kind of distracts you out of it, don't worry about it. Don't don't beat them up, don't beat yourself up, just come back into it. <clears throat> so wherever you are, get nice and comfy. I, I always am a big believer, as my teacher taught me, comfort is queen. Uh, so get nice and comfortable. You don't have to be in the lotus position. You don't have to be sitting so straight that it looks like someone shoved the sweeping brush somewhere they shouldn't have. Just get nice and comfortable and enjoy these few minutes. We've all taken the time and it's really, really cool that we're all on this together from all different parts of the world, all different parts of Ireland, and we're all tuned into this. So wherever you are, get nice and comfortable. And we're gonna take a nice, long, slow, deep breath to get started in through the nose, into your belly, hold it there, and just let that go. Why not put a hand onto your belly now? And that will encourage you to breathe a little bit deeper a little bit deeper into the lungs, take some more of that lovely oxygen into your lungs and into your blood and around the body to energize and help you feel balanced. You can breathe in through the nose and you can breathe out through your nose or your mouth, whichever is more comfortable. But the nose is a wonderful air filter. It's stuck to our faces. We might as well use it. So take another one of those nice, long, slow, deep breath in through the nose. Feel the belly rise underneath your hand. Hold it there and let that go. Really good. If this feels weird, a little bit different, a little bit awkward, just go with it. You've taken this time. The worst that can happen is you'll feel a little bit more relaxed than when you started. So just watching your breath now in through the nose, into the belly, feel the belly rise with each breath, and then you're gently letting that go. So we're going to do a little technique I call the one breath wonder. And this is for anyone who feels that they can't focus their mind for very long. Okay. And all we're going to do here is we're going to take one of those nice, long, slow, deep belly breaths in. We're going to hold that in our belly and then we're going to let our breath go. Okay. And we're going to feel the breath leaving our body. We're going to watch the breath go. We're going to listen to the sound of it. And I just need you to focus your attention on that one out breath, okay? So here we go, nice, long, slow, deep breath in. Into the belly, hold it there. Now let that breath go. Just watching the breath leave, listening to the sound, feeling the belly drop again, just enjoying the sensation of the breath leaving. Well done. Let's try one more of those, one breath wonders. Nice, long, slow, deep breath in through the nose. Hold it in the belly for a moment. Now let that go, just let that breath go. Just keeping your attention on your breath, feeling the belly drop, feeling the breath leave, listening to your breath leave your body. Well done. That is a one breath wonder. You can do that anytime, anywhere. And you can run five, six, seven, eight, ten, twenty 10, 20 of those, one after the other. And if you have a very, very busy mind, it's a very simple technique that you can use. So just keeping your breath going now, watching the breath go in, watching the breath go back out. So the next technique we're going to use is the 16 seconds. Sometimes it's called square breathing or box breath. And we're going to breathe into a count of four. We're going to hold that to a count of four. We're going to let that breath go to another count of four. And then we hold that breath out 
for another count of four. Don't worry, I'll guide you through it. So nice and relaxed. Take a nice, long, slow, deep breath in through the nose. Two, three, four. Now hold that breath in your belly. Just hold it there. Two, three, four. Now letting that breath go. Just letting that breath go, just like we did with the One Breath Wonder, just letting it go. Two, three, four. Now hold that breath out. Before you inhale again, two, three, four. And now just breathing normally again. Well done, everybody. That's a very simple technique. And again, you can use that wherever you are. If anything's going on around you, if you're in the queue for the shop or you're waiting on a bus, you can use that at any time. And it's a great one just to settle your nervous system. So just watching the breath nice and relaxed now. Watching it go in. And watching the breath go back out. Remember, whenever your mind wanders off, the sounds or sensations or any thoughts in your mind, just realize it's nipped off and just gently guide it back to your breath. Really good. I'd like you now just to bring your focus to your forehead, okay? I'm just gonna breathe into that space, into our forehead. Just imagine with every inhale, you're giving permission for all that area to relax, all those little muscles in your forehead and around the sides of your head, and giving them all permission to relax. And when we breathe out, we're releasing any tension, any stress, anything we've been hanging on to for the whole day. So just breathing into that space, into your forehead. And just let any tension just drip away. Drifting down to your jaw, down to your mouth. Just giving permission to your jaw and any muscles in your mouth just to relax. Just breathing into that area. And we let that go. Really good. I'd like you now to take your hands and just place them over your heart. Just place them on your chest. And with the breath in, you just give permission to all that area to relax. Anything you're hanging on to there, any stress, tension, or uncomfortable emotions you might have in there at the moment, just breathing in there. And with the out breath, we just let it all go. One more of those, breathing into the heart. And we just give permission for all that to release. Really good. Just slide your hands down now, one hand down onto your belly, and the other one just below your heart, just on your solar plexus there. And just feel how it feels to have your hands here. Just become aware of where your hands touch your body. Feeling any little sensations you have in your hands. Feeling your body move under each breath. Anytime your mind wanders, just bring it back to the sensations here, where your hands are, where your hands meet your body. And again, we're breathing into this space, breathing into where our hands are, 
And we're just giving permission for those areas just to let go of anything they're hanging on to, any tension, any stress. Just letting it go. It's okay if you feel a little bit emotionally wobbly when you're letting go of any stuff. We're just letting it pass through. Just enjoying this nice relaxed state we're in now. Busy days, busy minds. We're just giving our bodies and minds a chance to let all that go for a few moments. Just become aware of the kindness in your own hands. Sometimes we forget just how kind we can be to ourselves. Just enjoy that feeling now. Just letting our breath drift in and drift out. Well done. So you can just congratulate yourselves for taking this time be on this conversation with me and Brezzi, for taking the steps to find a new way of relaxing and calming your body and mind, to get to know yourselves a little bit better. And let's just send out some nice goodwill to everybody else on this call right now. Everyone on this video, just send out some positive wishes to everybody on this. And whatever you send out, it'll be multiplied by hundreds and hundreds. You'll get it right back. Well done. You can start to give your toes and your fingers a little wiggle. You can have a little stretch. And when you're ready, you can gently open your eyes and come back to the room. So how are you feeling now? <laughs> um, I certainly feel very relaxed. I kind of... <laughs> I hope you are too. <laughs> I'm, We're uh, just going to go to sleep now, so you can do whatever you guys want to do. I've got that, uh, you know, you get distracted by a million different things. Mine was hunger, and I kind of got me, I was like, I'm so hungry. And then you start creating what you want to eat and how you want, and then you want, <laughs> what, what, where, 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 Dermot, back to Dermot. And it, like, <laughs> I was in, I was in four different restaurants there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happens, and you create this entire thing, and you kind of realize it's 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 perfectly okay once you recognize that that's where you've gone. Yeah. And once again, there's there's I'm starving. It's just my body telling me I'm hungry. Go eat. You'll it's die that, if you don't eat food. It's that tennis ball. It's just yeah. realizing that it's bounced away, and you're just gently bringing it back. Um, and it's okay if your mind wanders. It's okay if you have thoughts. It's okay. Um, if it was bouncing all over the place or it felt a bit new and strange. If you saw colours, if you um, suddenly thought of someone that you loved or whatever happens. <clears throat> As I say in the book, you're just dipping your toe into that river, that, mm -hmm. that, that stream of consciousness that's just going through us at all times. You're dipping your toe in there when you go quiet and you will just experience whatever is happening there at that moment. You could do the same thing an hour later you could experience different things. And it's not to dwell on, on all the things that may have popped into your mind. It's just where we are. But also important to point out there with emotion, 
um, you need to learn to sit with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm. Sometimes it's not, not e sometimes what you sit with isn't pretty, and that's okay. And since we were children, Dharma, we were all told, don't be anxious, don't be scared, don't be sad. These are core emotions. You should feel them all. These yeah. are ex these are important emotions. Can't just dismiss them. See what it sits like. F feels like to sit with fear. Yeah. I want to get like? to some of the questions now. Um, Orla says, how often do you meditate and how do you start the day with meditation? Well, um, I have a chapter in the book called um, How Not to Be Crap. <laughs> and basically, the reason I have the guitar here is because I mentioned the guitar in the book. And, you know, for me, that is something that I dragged poor Dave from my radio show around and we spent ages trying to... As if find he didn't the, love it. The right guitar. Oh, he Buy loved guitars. it. Of course he did, yeah. Um, and, you know, when I go into my, my man cave and I see the guitar, I feel sad because um, I talked about guitars uh, and I um, looked at guitars and I watched video on guitars, but I just didn't do the practice. I just mm -hmm. didn't turn up to play the guitar. So my guitar gently weeps because <laughs> it's being ignored all the time. Yeah. And sometimes that can happen with meditation. And that's why so many of us become crisis meditators. So I have tips in the book. One of them is RPM, and it's a brilliant technique that my teacher <laughs> taught me. And it's rise, P meditate. Mm -hmm. So Orla, to answer your question, that's something that I use every morning. So mm -hmm. I rise, I do what I got to do in the bathroom, and I meditate. <laughs> before I pick up my phone, before I look at an email, before I look at a news feed, before I think about my radio show, before any of that, I set the table for how I want to feel that day. I take that moment because we have far more control over our day, over our moods <clears throat> than we think we have. Sometimes the day just seems like something that happens to us, that just we, we get out of bed and it lands on us and we just have to learn how to deal with it. Actually, we can set the trajectory for the day. We can set our Google Maps mm. and we can, we can at least try and plant the seeds in our subconscious as to how we'd like to feel for the day. So I like to meditate in the morning. When I wake up and I set my alarm for, uh, for uh, I, well, now I'm, I do about 40 minutes. But when I started, I only did like two or five, you know, and that's, mm. that's all my brain could manage at that time. Yeah. So it's set a target for yourself that's realistic. Don't try and become Mr. Miyagi straight overnight. You know, if, if you think, well, look, two minutes or 16 seconds is all I can do, then start with that. Um, and then I use another technique called RAW, which is right after work. And for me, that's great because it's kind of like having an emotional and psychological shower, you know, after the day, before you begin the next phase with the evening and generally with, you know, the mm. people that you live with. Um, and so for me, that's sort of resetting, hitting the reset button and, <sighs> and mm. going into the evening there. So and, and I always listen to a meditation at night. I love just having one on to help me feel sleepy. Mm. And sometimes it's like a cue for your subconscious. It goes, oh, I know this. This is sleepy, gone. sleepy time, yeah. me gone. Uh, just another one to try in the morning is, is if you struggle with meditation, is left hand, close your eyes, think of five things you have in your life that you're thankful for. So you hold on to your thumb. Just take the pen, but 15 seconds in each thing, the warmth of my bed, toast, I don't care. Just the fact that your brain is seeking something to be thankful for, you're framing your day that way. Yeah. That's how you're framing your day, put your feet in the floor, go about your day, and you f that's the attitude you bring into the day, it's an attitude of gratitude. Yeah. Barry asks, have you ideas on how to engage young children in meditation? Well, I happen to be sitting beside an author um, who has written several books on it. But in my own experience first, Barry and everybody else, is the best thing you can do is lead by example. Hmm. And certainly in my house, I've got three kids, 15, <coughs> 13, and 9. Um, they're their ages. I don't have that many children. <laughs> <laughs> and, or do you? <laughs> that I know of. Um, and... It's certainly they gravitate towards it, but it, they do it because they've seen me and my wife, Karina, do it. And particularly if you're listening to them at nighttime, because they hear the nice music and they hear the soft voices. And what's most important about that for me is that <clears throat> it's normalizing taking time out for ourselves, mm. normalizing de-stressing. It's normalizing calming down. That isn't watching telly or opening a bottle of wine. You know, they're seeing us do things that are their only purpose is to calm our nervous systems. You know, and you, I guarantee you, Barry, and everyone else, if you, if you want someone you care about to get into this stuff because you think they might need it, the best thing you can do is do it yourself and let them see you do it and let them see the changes in you when you do it. And the most important thing with kids is trying to tell a hyper kid to calm down 
is as pointless as it comes. Giving kids physical cues to engage mindfulness is the key. So that's why I always use fingers, heart. I say to a kid, you know, if they're really excited, do you have a fire in your belly? If you're angry, there's a fire, put the fire out. How do you put the fire out? With the breath. Every fire. And all of a sudden, they have a visualization. Mm. Kids, oh, I don't like my breath. What's your favorite color? Yellow. Breathe in yellow. Amazing. Yeah. They're in. Meet them where they're at with this. And where they're at is often where they're at. And, and I often think with kids, you've you got to translate it to a point that's, that's interesting to them. So physical cues, like if you do that with your fingers and you think of a really happy memory and breathe with that memory, what was your favorite day? Was it Christmas? Whatever, whatever. Think of that day and breathe with it. And then they're five minutes in, they don't even realize it. And I think that is a really engaging way to get kids into practice. And also, um, I, I use gratitude meditations with kids and stuff like that. But if the most important part of mindfulness with kids, ask them how they feel. Mm. This ridiculousness that, oh, I don't want to tell, ask kids, I might bring up, no, kids are well able to talk about emotion. Create a bridge of communication for it between you, the, the guardian and parent, and the kid. You start that bridge of communication now, it'll be there forever and nothing will get too much for that kid. Yeah, they'll have the tools. Patrick uh, says, I went from edgy to emotionally wobbly, as Dermot said, to chilled. This is from a first timer, thanks so much. Okay, so, you, well actually, that's a good prompt for our poll. Um, I'd love to just check in with how you feel now after our little mm. meditation there. And remember, that was only about five or six minutes there. Um, and there are all different kinds of meditations that you can do. Um, there's more free guided meditations on my website, on dermotwhelan.com, and you can check them out. We've got, I've got body scans in there, ones for anxious, worried minds. And of course, when you buy the book, you get access um, to special bonus meditations um, just for you, just for you, the people who have the book. And there's a code in the book that you can use on dermotwhelan.com. How do you feel right now? So you have same as the start, worse than before, hmm. a bit better, or don't talk to me, I'm too relaxed. So um, put your answers in there and we'll see, we'll see how you are. Um, but, it, you know, the ripple effect of a small technique, this is one of the reasons I wanted to write the book, was because I, I was so amazed that small techniques, small changes to your, your behavior, can have a far-reaching ripple effect. We all know that image of the stone dropping in the lake and it starts off small and grows and grows. You know, you don't have to blow up your life. You don't have to go to an ashram in India and have henna tattoos all over your body and <laughs> talk loudly want, about Dermot. Bali in conversations. Yeah, if that's you, what you want to do, that's go what for it. your boats. Yeah. But you know, you don't have to quit your job. You don't have to big, have a big confrontation with your boss. If you want to do all these things, fine. But generally, you don't, people think that uh, you know, it requires some big dramatic change, and it doesn't. A lot of the time, it doesn't. There may be aspects you want to change, and for some people, that's right. But for a lot of the time, it's just shifting a, a something small, yeah. and you be, can be really, really surprised at a change that some of these techniques can and do. And in for. fact, when you look at those massive changes that we make, we can become massively obsessive about exercise. I've got to exercise, or I've got to do this. That's usually a smokescreen for not wanting to deal with something that's there, like, a, like an acute stress that you, you don't want, a relationship problem. Let's train five times a day. And these massive changes that we make as human mm. beings are generally based on obsessive behavior. And obsessive behavior, whether it's good, a good behavior or not, is not healthy. It's not, it's, it's a smokescreen. Mm. Like so, triathlons. Like things. triathlons. And that, and that is <laughs> why Man. the day after I did Ironman, my mom goes, where's your bike when I sold them? This is ridiculous. <laughs> what am I doing to myself? I have no life. And I sold everything. So there you go. Yeah, we're just waiting on the, on the results of those, the poll there. Um, but I just want to thank everybody again for, you know, for taking the time to buy the book and to read the book. I hope you're enjoying it. Don't forget those uh, meditations are there. Um, I think, I think you look beautiful in the cover, may I say. It's, it's one of my favorite photographs of you. I know it's a quite, it's a, it's a, it is that kind of, can you just look over that way for that shot? Just <laughs> yeah. like, look, what, what, what am I looking at? But you do look, you look like you've a tan as well. You look well, really it was very beautifully lit. Well-shaped face. It's like on the seven millionth picture of, now move your right eyeball slightly no, no. to the left. Like, I feel like I want to know this guy. <laughs> that's, that's what you look like. Um, I do know you. So, okay, so we have 60% uh, people are, are feeling a, a bit better after it. So we've, we've improved people. And then 35% are, don't talk to me. I'm too, I'm too chilled out. <laughs> um, but, don't you know, watch EastEnders after this then. Yeah. That, that will ruin everything. 
If I, what I would say is, if anyone is really struggling, and I have a whole chapter in the book on play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because sometimes that's a great place to start. Oh yeah. If if the whole meditation world is still, you're thinking, mm, not so sure. For me, this this is my midlife. Well, I like to call it a midlife celebration rather than a midlife crisis. <laughs> but this is my skateboard. You call it whatever you want, Ernest. It's a crisis, OK? <laughs> I started skateboarding at, just at the beginning of lockdown. And it was, you know, as silly as it is, you know, and as much slagging as, as I was getting from Dave, you, and everybody else. <laughs> I didn't slag you. Um, it gave me something. It, it actually did a lot for me. And I'll tell you why, because obviously the world went to you know, went very weird very quickly. Yeah, yeah. And the streets around here in Dublin city centre were... Dead. Were dead. Yeah. And for a lot of people, it freaked them out so much they couldn't even come into town because it just seemed like the end of the world. Mm. But for me, because I'd started using that, suddenly mm. the entire city was, was a skate park. Mm. And, it, and I could go around without the threat of killing everyone that I came mm. across. Um, and so it just gave me a new perspective or something different to focus on. And, you know, it got me really interested in play and how it can improve our mood. And I felt I felt I was really happy after doing it, even, um, you know, just for a few minutes. So uh, Sabina Brennan is one of the brilliant people who I talked to in the book. She's a neuroscientist. And, you know, she talks about the power of play and how our brains crave learning new things. And we release dopamine. So all that time when I thought I was just kidding around on that thing, I was actually doing really nice things for my brain. And in turn, like... I was bringing, bringing myself into that present moment that we hear so much about. I mean, if you put yourself on a skateboard in your 40s, like that's mindfulness in motion because... If I do that, I'm in Vincent's within two, <laughs> yeah, two seconds. But you can't be in the past worrying about yeah. stuff that happened. You can't be in the future worrying about stuff that might happen. You're thinking just every bit of your <sighs> energy is trying to stay on this bloody thing and not break your neck. So quite by accident, I was creating another form of mindfulness by jumping onto this thing. And I, I watched those videos and I was like, you could see it. Yeah. And I, I think not just playfulness, but I miss a bit of boldness, a bit of mischievousness, just like not, not, in a, not in an intentionally negative way, but just like, you know those nights that you just go to your mates, we, we go fucking out. We, you know, or just someone, we go to West Cork tomorrow. I miss that spontaneity and that playfulness yeah. and, and, and that boldness. And I think, I think deep down in all of us, we need that. that. You know what I mean? You know that moment when you're with two or three mates and it gets to that kind of almost all-encompassing, you can't see straight because you're laughing so hard and you don't even know what you're laughing at and you've gone full circle. I miss that and I miss that. That's playfulness for me as well. And playfulness, you know, like things like th something like that where you need your concentration as well. It's become such a, it's such, it's really opened my eyes to, this, this whole pandemic for me has been so intense and everything is so serious and everybody's like, you can't say that, you can't do that. That's offensive. And videoing anybody who's doing anything remotely wrong. Know, yeah. Oh my God, voyeurism. Do you not realize how, how weird that is? Do you know in 1984, George Orwell, Big Brother's watching you. Now everyone's watching you and they're waiting for you not to, to do something mischievous or bold and go, oh my God, that person shouldn't exist. I'm like, no man, that's not humanity. We, we're, we're born to mess up from time to time, especially young people. And we should let people have some space to be stupid and to do silly yeah. things. And, and guys in their 40s. Yeah, exactly. You know, What's they can be stupid that? too. You know, <laughs> you know what would be really stupid if the two of us went on it together after this and we'll go down Grafton Street. You mean we can, do, we can start a skateboard <laughs> gang? No, but literally on the same board. The two of us. <laughs> and, and I'm holding you and it's kind of like a weird Titanic thing. And people are like, you're like, I'm going down Grafton Street. Is that Dermot Wien? Yeah. Well, um, the reason I have it here and the reason I, I was determined to put the chapter on play in there is because, you know, if for some reason you think, look, I, I, the meditation, I get it, but I'm just really struggling with it. Start with play. Yeah. You know, start with something that where you lose track of time. Maybe you used to play an instrument or maybe you likes to draw or maybe it was just rolling around on the lawn with your dog or, you know, playing with your new baby or anything or, or reading a book. Anything where traditionally you might have lost track of time while you were doing it or something that you used to do, used to love, and for some reason or whatever reason, life got busy, you don't do it anymore. Um, it could even be something as simple as calling up an old friend and, like you say, just having one of those stupid belly laughs. Mm. If that's where you need to start, then start there, you know? And this is the Just wear a helmet. That's I want to read uh, that you, you said about spirituality and mindfulness in general, because sometimes it takes itself too seriously, which is kind of a little bit what you're talking about there. And you, say, you said, like, you know... Um, 
why does the spiritual community take itself so seriously? So many of the books I had read were of people who looked mildly tortured in the profile pictures. You know the ones, hands joined in prayer and held under the chin as if to say it's not easy being this wise, but somehow I put it off. It's like Sometimes the... it can be like everyone is trying to out-spiritual each other and that laughing is an, an unnecessary distraction from looking holy. But David G was funny and laughed at himself and seemed to bust all the myths I had of the world of meditation and mindfulness. And it's so true because I often call it like the, the spiritual bypassing, these people going, that it's so insular, I'm concentrating on me. But mindfulness isn't about, and Buddhism isn't that. Buddhism is saying we're all intrinsically linked. I share the same light and breathe the same air as you. So by default, me and you are connected. And I often find mind, mindfulness and meditation, people who practice it very seriously, are very insular about it and quite selfish about it. And they're like, this is my, you know, I don't care about anything. You cannot be mindful if you're not political and you don't care about who's around you and how people are treated around you. And that's where it becomes this, as you said there at the end of your practice, there's, what, 3,000 people here this watching this. Send out a bit of soundness to them. Like, actually, that's an energy that you can pass out. And we're all linked. Everybody watching this are linked in some way. And isn't that kind of a nice thing to think about, that there's a shared humanity in that? And that's the humanity we need to start celebrating, not the fact that we're tearing each other apart on social media. It's just it's tiring now. And that, to me, is what mindfulness can really teach you, is how to connect properly to people at a much better level than, hey, by the way, I like your profile picture. Yeah, and I, but I think sometimes people can feel that maybe meditation is a selfish thing. Is it not just kind of me and I'm trying to focus on me and me? But actually, you know, for me, it's one of the least selfish things you can do because when you put yourself into a calmer, more relaxed, more comfortable state and more you, where you're more present for the people around you, you're freaking out less, you're not overreacting as much as you used to, that's the kindest thing you can do for the people around you. Yeah, it is. You know, again, it's that ripple that goes out. If... I, like I noticed, I talk about it in the book, like Dave, you know, my radio co-host for so many years, he's so brilliant in the book because he's witnessed me at my, you know, peaks and troughs, mm. you know, and he could feel the benefit of this other version of me coming to the table that was less reactive, was enjoying himself more, was prouder of the work we were doing, you know, and, and really appreciating things. And, and the people around you get the benefit of, these techniques, and, and that's what I'm, I'm really excited um, for people to experience. And sustainable, it, it's a form of sustainable happiness. It's not synthetic. It's not this, this idea of, you know, and I, I do believe, and, and, and I went back to the Buddhist psychologies of this, and that's where I, I know from my perspective, that's what grew my practice. And the first noble truth of Buddhism is suffering is an inevitable part about being a human. No one likes it, but it's part of our job. Life isn't a straight line. And in fact, what, what really can make that suffering a little bit handier and easier is not expecting your life to be perfect. It's not meant to be. Yeah. It, it's not. You're releasing yourself example. from that pressure. Yeah, you know, the I attachment about, of a perfect life. Yeah, and that word should, if we could strip one word out of the English language, yeah. it would be should. Because, man, we should ourselves from morning, from morning till night. Yeah. I should be healthier, I should be playing with my kids more, I should be you working You should be learning less. that guitar that you bought for... E exactly, yeah. There's a little bit of a should there. I can. But you really should be. I really should be. <laughs> <laughs> it's so shiny and nice. It's so nice. I, like, it you can't leave it in the house and not give it to someone who, like, <laughs> dirt or Dave I'm who going to do it. Thousand. I've just been busy writing a book. It'll, it'll well, happen. you're you've time to do this midlife crisis thing. <laughs> Why can't you do a midlife crisis rock and roll star? I've already been in a band. You see, I'm a drummer. Technically, I shouldn't really have a guitar. I shouldn't be allowed. You shouldn't allow anything. Yeah. Um, Brezzy, thanks so much for... Thank you. And well done, man. Really well done. Thank Huge you. Huge week. Um, very special thank you to uh, all the wonderful people at Gill Books for uh, looking after me and you and your projects. Um, it was an absolute pleasure. And thanks to uh, Niamh and Niamh and Andy and Noel and all the team at... Uh, NK Management, who have been guiding me through all this as well, and uh, to Today FM for housing us here in their beautiful studios. Yeah, we're the only ones here. Um, and most of all to you guys for, for picking up my book. I'm so grateful. I, I really hope you get, you know, you get something out of the book and that something somewhere in the pages clicks with you because they're techniques that have worked so well for me over the years. And I really hope um, that, you know, they have similar effect and don't forget dermotwhelan.com i've loads of tips in there as well you have access to the bonus meditations from the book and there's also free guided ones up there that anyone can listen to anytime and um yeah thank you all so much i've really enjoyed this evening it's been 
an absolute pleasure chatting to you and to get out of my house. Uh, yes, it's been and wonderful. I, it has, and I must also say thank you to Eason as well, to everybody at Eason's for um, organizing this launch and, and hosting everybody, and uh, to Ellen and, and, and all the crew. Where's the after party? The, the after party? Is the after party. Oh, are you saying to thank my wife, Karina? <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me to thank my wife. Of course, I thank. Now we can't I'm say it. It's ten times worse now. <laughs> yeah. It's worse. You just made things awkward. And look, he's getting that purple face thing again. Oh no! There's the boy who went purple. <laughs> thank you, Karina, and my family, and my dog, and oh my God, everyone has ever known me. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's been a great evening. So I hope you enjoyed it, everybody. Thanks a million, man. Well done. <laughs>